Okay, welcome to video number 50 of the Diaries of Coronavirologist YouTube channel. I've hit a milestone, halfway to 100. Today is the 21st of January, and we are up to about 97 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 around the world, and getting close to 2.1 million confirmed deaths. So I started doing little recaps of what was going on in the COVID world this time last year. So this week of the 20th kind of time of January. So this time last year, the US had its first confirmed case of COVID-19. A man was hospitalized in Washington state and found to be positive for COVID-19. I doubt that was the first true case of COVID-19 in the US, but it's the first documented. It's also the same time that Hong Kong and Taiwan had their first cases of COVID-19. And the 19th of January also had this wonderfully well-aged headline that I found in the archives. That's definitely aged like milk. In some good news from the US to start with, I've been seeing reports today from epidemiological modelers, somewhat outside my area of expertise, so I have to trust what they're putting out. But the models are suggesting that the US may have reached a peak and maybe slowing down in the number of new cases from this winter surge we've been having. However, there is still the looming spectre of these new variants. So the UK variants, B117, for example, which seems to be transmitting faster in people in the UK. Now, I did a previous video on that variant and talked on that generally about mutations in viruses, what drives it, the selection pressures to evolve, things like that, and talked a bit about the UK variant in specific detail at the time. And I'll put a link to that previous video down in the description if you want to go back. Today's video, though, I'm going to talk about variants in a, a little bit further. So I'm going to take a little look at the South African variant that's emerged, so that's B1351, and talk a little bit about vaccines and the variants as per the title of the video. Okay, to start with the South African variant, so I've seen it referred to as B1.351 and also 50, 501Y.V2 for version 2. So it's got a couple of different names. I'll generally refer to it as the South African variant, though the technical definition is the numbering because of trying to avoid associations with places. So there was a paper put up onto BioArchive that I saw today about this variant and somewhat concerning detail for its ability to potentially reinfect people who've recovered from a COVID-19 infection from the, let's say, original virus or the wild type virus. So this study, which I've linked to down below, was performed by people at the National uh, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases in South Africa, the NCID. And they were looking to see if the South African variant and some other variants are insensitive to antibodies that were taken from COVID-19 or people who recovered from COVID-19. So this is convalescent plasma or serum that was taken from those patients. In the study, they collected serum from 44 patients and they found that all that serum was capable of inhibiting the wild type, the original SARS-2 virus, from infecting cells in the lab. So it neutralized the ability of the virus to infect cells and to subsequently kill them. Now, they had a range of disease severity in the people they took the convalescent plasma from. So they had all the way from mild cases up to severe hospitalization cases. And what they found was that generally the people who had the more severe cases at a higher level of neutralizing antibody. So the way this works out is you dilute antibody across a long range and you look to see at what level you get virus killing your cells. So the higher the antibody, the more dilute you have to go in order to see death. And that's how you judge the level of neutralizing protective antibody that is present. So they see that the people with more severe disease develop more neutralizing antibody. And this is kind of a general theme. This has been seen by quite a few different people. So that's no great big surprise, but cool to see happening again. What was more concerning, though, is they also tested the same serum samples from those patients that could neutralize the wild type original SARS-2 virus against the South Africa variant and some variations within. 
So the South African variant has mutations to the spike protein. And that's obviously what everyone's concerned about right now, because the spike is the major driver of the ability of the virus to infect cells. And it's the major target for antibodies. So it has some mutations in similar to the UK variants, along with a few extra mutations that are in the receptor binding domain. So that's obviously the most important part for spike to bind to the receptor on the surface of cells to allow it to infect. And that's also a great site for antibodies to bind to because if they bind to the receptor binding domain of spike, the spike can't bind to the receptor on cells and therefore it can't infect the cells. So mutations in the receptor binding domain are of concern. And the South African variant has some different mutations there to what's seen in the UK variant or some extra mutations in that region. So they tested this variant and various combinations of these receptor binding domain uh, mutations, which I won't go into too heavily. But what they found is that from those 44 serum samples they collected from their patients with varying degrees of severity, 40 Oh, sorry, half 48%, so nearly half of the samples they collected had lost neutralization ability completely. So there was no inhibition of the South African variant's ability to infect cells and to kill those cells. So that is concerning, and that's not something we want to be seeing, obviously. The the level of antibody from the initial infections, those initial sera, the higher it was, the more chance it had that it was going to inhibit the new virus. But generally, it looks like that virus might be escaping the antibodies produced from people who have recovered from COVID-19. So this is concerning to see, but it's not panic stations just yet. So we don't fully know or have much of an idea how neutralization in our lab truly correlates to protection in a human. It's all very well and good for antibodies that we study in a dish in the lab or a plate in the lab to inhibit a virus's ability to infect cells or to not do that. But how that correlates to protection is a bit unclear. Obviously, the higher the amount of neutralizing antibodies, probably the more likely the person to be person is to be protected. But we don't know what a lower threshold is for that. Also, they found in the samples collected from these patients that there were antibodies in the serum they collected that could still bind to the spike protein, even though they weren't neutralizing the ability to infect cells in a lab. Now, those non-neutralizing antibodies could still be playing important roles in a full body with a full immune system. They're not doing anything in some cells in addition to a lab, but in a full body, they might still be protective. And importantly as well, the antibodies that are produced by B cells of our immune system are only half of the adaptive immune system, loosely. There's also T cells, which haven't been looked at here. So just because we're seeing escape from neutralization from antibodies, that doesn't mean that this virus is going to reinfect everyone who's had COVID-19 already. It's a suggestion that potentially it can, but until we start getting the epidemiological evidence for that, that isn't cause to freak out just yet. What this data may be potentially suggesting is how this virus may infect people in the future and cause less severe disease, similarly to how flu infects people all the time. So it's possible that those people have lingering antibodies that aren't fully neutralizing, but can do enough to impact the ability of the virus to infect lots of cells and to grow to really high levels and cause severe disease, and instead result in a more, more minor disease. So maybe this is an indication that eventually this virus may evolve to be something like flu, where it infects people every year, or you go get your vaccine every year or whatever it may be. But right now, it's just a little bit too early to know. More study needs to go into this virus. And as well as studying the virus in the lab, more study needs to be put into working out if people are being reinfected by these variant viruses or by the South African or similar variant viruses. And I'm going to come back to that at the end of this video, because I also want to talk a little bit about vaccines. So, of course, the other thing we're concerned about with these variant viruses is that they might be able to mutate and escape the vaccines that we're now using to try and protect people. So the mRNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna and the DNA-based vaccine of AstraZeneca all carry the genetic material to produce the spike protein of a specific sequence. If the virus that's infecting people has changed the sequence of its spike protein through mutations, as we're seeing, that may render the antibodies that are produced to the first sequence useless. And so the second sequence can 
escape because it changes shape and the antibodies can't bind. So researchers at the Rockefeller University have looked into this and there's another paper put up on BioArchive this week that again I'll link to down below. So these researchers took serum samples from people who have received either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. So there's a total of 20 with 14 being Moderna receivers and six being Pfizer receivers. And all of these people had received both doses and there'd been a period of time after the second dose, a good period of time. So those people have the chance to fully mount their proper immune response that should develop following their vaccination with these two vaccines. They then did essentially the same thing that I was talking about in the South African variant study. They looked to see if that serum could neutralize virus and they tested it against the normal wild type mutating virus, the original virus, and various combination of these mutants and variants that I've been talking about. So they looked at the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazil variant, and all of the different mutations. And to summarize it, they found that at most there was about a threefold loss in neutralization. There wasn't that complete loss that was seen in the South African study. So it suggests that maybe the vaccines are eliciting a stronger antibody response than was seen in the serum taken from the patients, although it's very hard to compare these kind of things between studies. So there's a small but not insignificant loss in the amount of neutralization against these variant viruses. So it's a bit concerning to see a small drop. But again, as I say, we don't know what a lower threshold for these antibodies are. It could be that that high level that's produced from the vaccines is massively in excess of anything that's needed. So a threefold drop might not actually have any impact on whether people can be infected with these viruses or whether they stay protected because of the vaccine. And again, to use a similar talking point that I brought up earlier, this also doesn't take into account the T-cell response. So even though there's a slight drop in the amount of neutralizing antibodies, there's other parts of the immune system which aren't being assessed here. So this small drop in efficacy, while not insignificant, isn't cause for mass panic about these vaccines just yet. We need further study and further evidence to see if people are being infected after they've received their vaccines. And to that end, I think it's important that places doing studies need to keep track of whether they are testing people who have received one or two doses of either any of the vaccines and when they received it in relation to when they get a positive test. So if someone is in hospital for COVID, or they just go and have their nose swabbed or whatever it may be, I think there needs to start being a tracker of whether the people who test positive have received vaccines. That's the only way we're really going to get the data to see if the vaccines are losing efficacy. Right now, it's all well and good showing that you can infect cells in the lab or not infect cells in the lab, but for that to actually have any real world bearing, we need the data about whether people who get vaccinated are becoming infected with SARS-2 coronavirus and whether that is indeed a variant. So right now, even though it's a little bit concerning to see people see the loss of neutralizing antibodies in these samples in the lab, that doesn't tell us too much about whether these vaccines are losing their efficacy. And as well, it's important to remember that these vaccines, based on their numbers of 95% protection, are some of the best vaccines we've ever produced, if that number really holds true as more and more people get it. So even small drops in the efficacy of these vaccines won't render them completely useless. Every year, people get a flu vaccine that has maybe 50% efficacy, just to give a ballpark figure to compare by. And a talking point I've used on this channel before is the fact that these mRNA and DNA-based vaccines are actually very pliable in the lab. Should it be the case that they lose all efficacy and people start to become infected by variant viruses, Technically, it's not very hard to change the mRNA sequence or the DNA sequence to make the mutant spike so that the vaccines are now tracking the virus that's emerged. I don't know regulatory wise if how easy it would be to then put that into people, whether it would need to go through new trials or not. But in principle, we should be able to try to keep up with the variant viruses that are emerging so long as we know they're emerging and so long as we know that they are indeed escaping the protection from our vaccines. The only way we'll find that is by tracking it properly. 
So that's largely what I want to say about variants and vaccines and variants and potential reinfections, the South Africa variants. But I do want to leave with two other points. So firstly, it's important to remember that these variant mutated viruses can only emerge by infecting people. If people don't get infected, a virus can't mutate. A virus can't do anything unless it infects a host. So the only way that these viruses are emerging is because we continue to have, continue to have uncontrolled spread. So it's really important to continue to try and limit transmission of this virus, continue physically distancing, continue wearing masks, continue washing hands and being conscious of what you touch. If we limit the amount of spread of this virus, we limit the amount of variants. And somewhat equal, well, equally, but maybe somewhat more importantly, people who are now getting vaccinated or are soon to be vaccinated, it's imperative for these people, especially to be very conscious of not getting infected. While these vaccines may protect you from severe disease, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't carry the virus. And if you're carrying the virus, that can mutate, it can evolve, and it will evolve under the selective pressure that's from the vaccine-induced antibodies and immune response. So that's the way to get a virus that becomes insensitive to the vaccines. So it's very important to continue doing all the things to try and limit spread of this virus. And the final point on that note that I want to end on is a general reminder about vaccines and the chances of being infected. So it takes roughly two weeks for these vaccines to start showing protection. If people get infected within a two week period before the vaccines, there was no real clear evidence of protection from the vaccine. And that's because it takes around two weeks or three weeks or so for antibodies to be produced in your body that then play a big role in protecting you. In the US right, right now, we are experiencing over 200 new cases a day. So therefore, there's a slim but not insignificant chance that people who are getting vaccinated are also getting infected on the same day, or at least a few days before while incubating the virus, or the two week period after. So there is a not insignificant chance of people who get vaccinated to become infected before the vaccine can have any protective impact. Now, it's not the vaccine is giving those people the virus. Those people are just incredibly unlucky timing wise. But once again, that leads to a chance for a virus to evolve in the presence of a selective pressure from vaccines. And that's how we make vaccine resistant viruses. So again, just to hammer home the point, it's still so important to continue physically distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, all those kind of things. Even if you're now getting your vaccines, even if you've had them, it's important. And if you're waiting to get them, it's important. And that isn't to say that that's going to be the case forever by any means. It's just in this period where there's such high case counts and such uncontrolled spread of these viruses, as I'm saying, that's the perfect recipe to get more and more variants and to promote the introduction of variants that can escape our vaccines. Once spread is much more under control, that's when things can be loosened. But right now, it's imperative to continue doing the physical distancing, mask wearing, vaccine or not, because we don't want to end up in a situation where our vaccines are useless in under a year because the virus has spread so uncontrollably. And I just want to keep hammering home that point. I'll probably keep raising it on the channel over the next few videos. And with all that said, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like for the new YouTube metrics. Please leave questions and comments down below and I'll do my best to respond to them. It sometimes takes me a bit of time depending how busy I am, but I do try and get around to them. If you're new around here and you like the video and you want more, there's a catalog of 49 other videos. I've just hit 50, but please remember to subscribe if you wanna keep up with the new videos. And as always, please stay safe. As I say, wash your hands, wear a mask and keep calm and carry on. We will get through this pandemic.